what we're talking about today, Penny for Your Thoughts, Changing Coins in a Changing Culture. As you know, we have fairly recently gotten rid of the penny, which we've been using for more or less a thousand years. So I wanted to kind of take a look at the penny, what we've been doing with it and what we haven't been doing with it, and see what's happened. Now, when I was first talking with SFU about the title for this, I wanted to call it a loony for your thoughts, <laughs> which I think is much nicer because I think that's the direction where we're going. But part of the question is, what do we lose by getting rid of the penny? What do we gain by getting rid of the penny? And people's attitudes towards this little coin are, to me, frankly, very, very strange. Uh, when you look at the attitude in the United States to the penny, where they're going to keep it until the end of time because change means instability and Lincoln's on the penny and who knows what all else. People's attitudes are very strong about this little coin. Some people say, oh, I just throw them in the trash. I can't be bothered with them, which of course says more about them than it does about the coins. And other people really, really like them. And I'm one of the people that really, really like them. So we'll see if we can explore this a little bit. Uh, our poor little penny, when it was decommissioned, uh, there were a few little obituaries of the penny, 1858 to 2013. So the last Canadian penny was minted in May of 2012, nearly two years ago. And then it took a while to kind of ease them out of circulation because there's millions and millions of the things running around. So it was just about a year ago, 13 months, on the 4th of February 2013, that the government stopped distributing them, saying if you want them, find them somewhere else. We are not giving them out anymore. Ask, beg, plead, it doesn't matter, we're done. Banks, of course, still have to take them again until the end of time, because that's part of our cultural value with currency. And it's the same in the US, it's the same in the UK. If it was ever our money, it's always good. That doesn't mean that everybody is going to take your sack of 19th century pennies, but if you find the appropriate banker, eventually they will get you to a point where somebody will redeem them for current values. So <clears throat> thinking about this, I've updated it till today, 1st of March 2014. A few pennies remain in circulation. I have one in my wallet right now because I found it on the street and it's lucky. Uh, and there were all sorts of dire predictions for what would happen in the transition when people started rounding to the nearest five cents for cash transactions. Uh, you know, the government would collapse, uh, we would be invaded by aliens, never mind that this went just fine in Australia and New Zealand more than a decade ago. Uh, Chaos has, in fact, been minimal. Uh, these days, I have a great fun in Safeway when you go in and you use those little self-checkout machines. Uh, it rounds for you. And so if you put in a penny for cash, you can sometimes trick it if, you, if it comes to, you know, $14 and two cents, it'll round down. But if you put in another penny, then it will have to give you back a nickel and you can, you can play this little game. <laughs> Sometimes I lose because you have to do the math backwards and I'll put in a penny when I shouldn't have and oh, then I lose, but me and Safeway, we're, we're okay with this. <clears throat> so what killed off the penny? Well, the basic answer is inflation. What the penny is worth is less and less over time. So you can probably remember in your youth or perhaps your grandparents' youth when a penny would actually buy something. Now, in my own youth, I can't remember anything other than sort of gumballs from the gumball machine that were worth a penny, but you could actually exchange a single penny and get something, even if it wasn't much, as, as recently as the 19th uh, <laughs> But that's been a while. So the purchasing power, this nice little chart here shows from 1970 to 2006 inflation. But basically, for the US and Canada, sometimes we're close, sometimes we're not. But more or less, we've got the same curve. And uh, if you want to look at this in uh, terms of actual value, 100 years ago, what one 
currency units, penny, dollar, whatever, would buy, depending on the product, some, some things are a little more expensive relatively than others, but more or less a penny was worth 20 to 25 cents now. If you want to look at that in different terms, our lowest denomination of currency now has much less purchasing power than it did 100 years ago, even after we got rid of the penny. And it, it takes a while to kind of work your brain around the math there. So if you think about it, right now we've got nickels, dimes, and quarters. Forget the penny for a second. So if our quarter is worth what the lowest denomination was, then our dime is more or less the old half penny, and the nickel is a farthing, and I, I know the math doesn't work out exactly. But the point is, even without the penny, we're dealing in itty-bitty tiny currency units that our grandparents who could buy stuff with a penny didn't have to deal with. And that brings up the question, well, why do we even care? Why don't we happily shed currencies as soon as they lose value? And it becomes an issue of immersia, I, I, sorry, immersia, it's a new word, emotion and inertia, or <laughs> immersia. <laughs> so it's a pain, and again, when people talk about changing currency, they think, what are we going to do? There's not a slot in the cash drawer for this coin, and nobody has ever invented something called a divider. You know, how will we deal with these problems? But they loom larger. So, while we see where this emotion comes from, let's kind of take a brief look at the history of the thing. And as some of you know, I am a language nerd, so you're just going to have to be patient with me. All right, deep history now. There was a time before the penny, strange as this may seem, and all of the countries that spoke Germanic languages, these are related languages, so in ancient Germany, in ancient Scandinavia, in ancient England, they used a unit of currency, and the, the Anglo-Saxon pronunciation of this word is schert, uh, and then we reborrowed the same word via Norse, which is the thing we like to do, and then it became Scott, uh, which ultimately arrives in Scott, but that's the end of the paragraph, we're not there yet. So this word basically meant a coin of very small value. It's probably borrowed from the Slavic languages because in ancient times the Germanic people and the Slavic peoples were not too far from each other uh, around the shores of the Baltic Sea. And it probably ultimately is related to the word for cattle. In ancient times the cow was kind of a good unit of value because it was the largest and most delicious of the domesticated animals. And it's a pretty easy way of storing wealth if you're a relatively mobile agricultural society and or warrior aristocracy. So we value cattle quite highly, and we tend to think of them as money on the hoof. <coughs> Am I buzzing? Ah, that's much better, isn't it? I don't know why that was even plugged in. There's no, there's no sound. Pennies don't really make any noises. They don't go, cheap, cheap. So there's no real need to get sound for the computer. So uh, there's a few other words running around that are derived from cattle words. In English, we've got the word fee, uh, which is related by very complicated Indo-European things to Latin pecunia, uh, which is the Latin word for money. And then this schat word comes into modern Germanic languages. In modern German, we've got the word schatz, treasure or darling. You know, people can refer to each other as schatz. It's very cute. And I think there's a Dutch cognate as well. And then in English, we've got this uh, odd little expression that survives, scot-free, uh, which means if you get off scot-free, you don't even have to pay a little fine, not even a cheap old scot which is worth so little that we haven't even used the money since the early Middle Ages. So we had this lovely word, but gradually we replaced it with this new thing, a penning. And we're not really sure what the word means, so please don't ask me. There's some theories running around. Uh, you'll note this ending, this ing, it generally is a suffix that means kind of belonging to somebody. Uh, I just saw there was a story in the news about the treasure of the Nibelungs, 
Uh, and that ung in German is the same. So the idea that some <coughs> belonging to people, some uh, uh, a place name that belongs to people like Birmingham, the home of the people of this guy, Berm, the Birmings. So maybe there was somebody called Penn who was important. Penna, it is an Anglo-Saxon name, but we, we really have no idea. Uh, we first see this coin, in any case, in England in the 8th century AD. So it's probably the Anglo-Saxons. It could be the Frisians, which are a closely related people on the continent. But in either case, it was them who introduced the silver penny. And the fact that it's made of silver is comparatively important, so I'll just stress that for a second. Silver is an awesome metal. It's from my point of view as a folklorist, it's most interesting because it, it's quite magical. There's a lot of things you can do with silver which are positive, and we're not really sure if the association with money came first or the association with positive magical stuff came first. Ultimately, they all derive from the comparative rare, uh, rareness, is that a word? The comparative rarity of the metal as well as the function of the metal. So silver and gold, uh, though silver will tarnish, it's still fairly durable, unlike iron, which will rust and then no longer be there. So we've got this coin made of silver, this valuable, useful, magical metal. Uh, this here is an example of a silver penny from King Offa, Offa Rex. Uh, you may be familiar with him, Offa of Mercia. He's the one who made Offa's dyke, which is to keep the Welsh out of England from overrunning the country, or, if you'd like another perspective, to keep the English invaders on their proper side of the dike and keep them from overrunning Wales any further. Uh, so this is where we see it first. Some of our evidence points to England, linguistic evidence, we're not entirely sure it could go a little bit beyond, but somewhere in this world. They then send this out, and it gets borrowed by all sorts of other people. So the Germans borrow the word as Fennig. So originally it goes from Anglo-Saxon into German. The Swedish borrow the word Penning as well. And then they use this as a unit of currency throughout the Middle Ages. It's got a good, long life. Now you'll remember our little obituary dated the penny from 1858. Well, that's really kind of a Canadian-centered perspective. In fact, we've been using this coin for well over a thousand years, since sometime in the 700s. And its death in 2013, it's really just the latest in a long line of deaths. Uh, the Swedes were actually the first that I'm aware of to kill off the penny in 1548. So they got rid of it for a variety of reasons. But they kept the word around. And you'll excuse me, I don't speak Swedish. I cannot pronounce it properly, so I'm just going to butcher this. Uh, pengar, or pengar, not sure. Uh, it's a plural noun meaning money. So pennies. They don't use the coin anymore, and they haven't for, in fact, uh, going on 500 years. But they still think of it as a kind of a basic thing that makes up money. Uh, the Germans, of course, rather famously killed off the pfennig when they went over to the euro because the division of the euro is the euro cent and uh, nothing to do with the good old penny. So there it goes. And of course, in England, it's a little more complicated. They still got them running around in their colonies, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. We've given it up. The US is clinging on for all they're worth. So <clears throat> while we're playing with language a little bit, in Britain, they make a distinction one penny, plural pennies, for the actual physical coins. And in North America, we're not supposed to call them pennies. We're supposed to call them cents. But of course, we do anyway. And in Britain, the value, when we're talking about something being worth 27 pence. So if you've got 27 pennies, you've got 27 little objects. But if you've got 27 pence, you need only have maybe a two-penny piece and a couple of five-penny pieces, you know, whatever you need. But you don't actually have to have any pennies to make up that unit. If I were smarter, I would have picked a rounder number. We also have this system. And uh, some of you may remember this. Back in the, the good old days when you really, really needed math to go to the grocery store, <laughs> the English currency values were written with these bizarre little symbols. And the symbol for pence was a D. And that's an abbreviation of the Latin word denarius, 
which is a division of the gold solidus, uh, abbreviated S, or if you like, just a slash. Uh, and then, of course, there was the libra or pound, which is an L with a little hook through it. Uh, the slash is seriously secretly an S from Roman cursive writing. It's just a Roman cursive. It, it really just looks like, you know, a very angry cat has gotten onto the paper and scratched it up. But Roman uh, epigraphers can actually read this stuff. I'm always very impressed. So we've got denarius for penny, solidus for shilling. Think that S stands for shilling, but it doesn't. And the pound symbol for pound, pounds, shillings, and pence. And those are kind of the three basic units of British currency. Over here in North America, we don't have three units. We only have two. So it always takes a while to kind of wrap your head around because the dollar is really more like the shilling than the pound, but we think of it as more like the pound. But the penny is the penny, and we can be happy with that consistency. All right, so let me just kind of take it back to Rome for a second, a little bit of a diversion. Uh, Roman coinage, of course, this, this is a terrible slide to show you because, in fact, there was no particular time when you had this exact system in place. Uh, but we're simplifying things, compressing a few hundred years of history into one slide because we can. Why not? It's not like anybody will ever actually see this, right? <clears throat> so you've got the bronze ass, this low-value coin. And again, we tend to think of that as being the penny equivalent. But remember that throughout the Middle Ages, the pennies were silver. And anything below a penny would be bronze. So, so really, this little throwaway bronze ass, which in fact was inflated out of existence in the Roman coinage system, our penny is equivalent to the silver denarius. And that also survives as a couple of money words. Uh, there's Spanish dinero, Arabic dinar, and I didn't look it up, but I wouldn't be surprised if Russian jengi were also related to this word, but not actually sure. Uh, and when these two were in circulation together, which they were for a while, the <coughs> denarius was worth eight or ten asses. Originally, it was worth ten. Uh, that's where the den part comes in. But, you know, inflation changes. Then we've got the gold coin. And, of course, there's a bunch of silver coins in the gold coin. That was introduced a little later. And there's various different gold coins because of this inflation problem. So we've got the gold aureus, or we've got the solidus. Uh, later, remember, solidus becomes the word, doesn't become the word, it's equivalent to a shilling. So you can see for this little value chart that the denarius kind of waffled between 8 and 10 asses. All right. But the gold aureus, or solidus, waffled between 25 denarii to 275,000 denarii. Uh, <clears throat> they did not have a Jim Flaherty in charge of <laughs> Roman currency. So <clears throat> what happens is between inflation, chaos, different emperors, problems with counterfeiting, different coins change. And the different relational values change from time to time. So it's really hard to get a good, solid picture of where it is. I mean, even discussing it now, you would be forgiven for thinking that the aureus, aureus and the solidus were the same thing, that they weren't, uh, just different gold coins, which could be measured in denarii. But more or less, the picture we get from history is that your basic unit is this small silver coin worth some stuff, divisible into further smaller bronze units. And if you had enough of them, you could have a nice, durable, happy gold unit. And that's the system that we basically keep and continue moving things around, more or less, up until we get to the British pound. All right, so let's go back to our British pound for a second. This is just so much fun. I, I love dividing things into 12s. So from Offa in the 8th century right up until 1971 with decimalization, a penny was a twelfth of a shilling. And a shilling, there were 20 of them in the pound, meaning that there were 240 pennies to the pound. And you can do all sorts of, and British currency stuff, you get all these fun names and these weird units like the guinea, which is 21 shillings, so uh, mess. 
Um, but then from decimalization, they didn't actually change the relationship of the shilling to the pound. A 5p coin is still basically a shilling. It's 1 20th of a pound. It's there. It's useful. It's used. You've got these little smallest silver coins now in Britain are these 5p pieces. They're only silver in color, not in metal contents, but you know, what can you do? And uh, the pound is still the pound. But what changed was the relationship of the penny and the shilling. Instead of 1 12th of a shilling, it now becomes 1 5th of a shilling. So all decimalization did was reassess the penny, and everything else proceeds from that. Uh, and when we get to the, the question and answer period, by the way, you guys are always welcome to shout out at any time, but I always love hearing people's memories of decimalization. And uh, I, I, my general impression is that getting rid of the penny did not induce a whole lot of chaos. It was basically pretty straightforward. But decimalization did introduce a little bit of chaos and was more or less not terribly straightforward. Is that a fair impression? Yes, <laughs> some heads nodding. So again, I keep stressing the silver. The penny was always silver until the Georgians got a hold of the country, 1797. After that, everything just goes to hell in a handbasket. The penny, maybe it's copper, maybe it's bronze, maybe it's nickel, maybe it's zinc. Maybe it's plastic. Maybe it's only electronic on your credit card statement. But it's no longer silver. So I think if we're going to kill off the penny, OK, maybe the Swedes got rid of it first. But you know, things are different in Sweden. It's this point where you're really making the, the penny expendable. You're moving it from that denarius category, that silver solid heart of the currency system, down to the kind of the lesser bronze throwaway money category. And that's what hurts. So uh, that's kind of where the penny stands in relationship to its value as, as money, as currency. But what I'm most interested in as a folklorist is what people do with the penny besides use it for money. You, know, you would think that it's just money, but in fact, there's a whole lot of penny customs ranging from the interesting and normal to the really, truly, deeply strange. And I'm not sure how far we're going to get into strange territory, but we'll have a look at this and see what's happening, because I'm curious what's going to happen to all these beliefs and customs and sayings and superstitions after the penny. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, I should say one more currency side that I completely forgot about. This was the 1858 date. Basically, the penny is the lowest Canadian denomination you've ever had, unless you count the half cent that was circulating when we still used American, British, whoever's currency. But as long as there's been Canadian currency, it's basically been the penny at the bottom. Again, the core of the thing. Um, and the British have only had the penny as their lowest in 1983 when they got rid of the half penny. Just a little bit of variety there. OK, so let's talk about the penny in culture. Little cartoon here. The tree climbing rabbit, don't ask me to explain that either, says to the angry squirrel, uh, Penny for your thoughts, Flynn. I was thinking how much time I waste answering your pointless, inane questions. And then he says, so where is my penny? So this is part of the title of this lecture, A Penny for Your Thoughts. How long are people going to keep saying that? What are they going to do when there's no such thing as a penny? You know, if you say to your grandkids, a penny for your thoughts, they'll say a what? <laughs> eventually. Now they still know, but eventually. So we find this appearing in a collection by Haywood, who is a, a paremiologist from the 16th century, in other words, one who collects proverbs. Uh, <coughs> already is a proverbial phrase. So by 1546, this was something people were saying, a penny for your thoughts. And in this era of constant cultural change, I mean, this is a balance. We want to preserve diversity. This is something we value very highly. And we want to preserve anything of value. But then if you preserve everything, then pretty soon you can't move for stuff. So some culture, some language pretty much has to go in order for us to be able to incorporate new things. The question is what and how do you decide? And the answer is usually we decide organically, and sometimes organically can kind of bully smaller 
cultural unit, so we've got to try to watch that, but we'll see what happens with this penny. We get the expression penny wise and pound foolish already from 1607. And I think this is a good key to where things are going to go. Because I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, my mother used to use this expression to me. And I didn't know what a pound was. I just knew the expression, penny wise and pound foolish. So I assumed, because I was a dumb kid, that this meant a unit of weight and it was like a whole bunch of other proverbial expressions that really didn't make any sense. It wasn't something you deconstructed word by word. It was just, you know, wise with money, bad with weight, but don't be one and not the other. Of course, I was completely wrong, but it does show that the expression continues, although the unit of currency was not relevant to me growing up. We've got a penny saved is a penny got from 1640, and of course later that evolved into a penny saved is a penny earned. You know, that's good, but if you use this expression nowadays, you often get the response, yes, but who cares about a penny? And even a dollar saved is a dollar earned is not terribly exciting. That's, you know, got to work with what we've got. And then we've got in for a penny, in from a pound from 1695. So these are all things that we first see in the 16th or 17th century set expressions that survive the centuries, that are a part of our cultural heritage as English speakers. And how long will these be around? Again, that second one, I still assume that was weight. I dumb kid. <clears throat> so we've got a few other idiomatic phrases that don't really survive. Penniless, the expression as to be poor, comes from 1330. So when not having a penny was a considerably larger amount of money not to have than it is today, but we still use this. We'll still talk about someone being penniless. But some of the other idioms, anyone ever heard to sit on the penniless bench? Yeah, no. Uh, this was referring to a specific type of church architecture. There was a place you could sit that was known as the penniless bench. And I'm not familiar enough with early church customs to say definitively I totally understand this, but I gather it was a spot where you know, they weren't going to pass the collection plate to you or they might distribute charity, but there was some place there's a reason to sit there, but also it's a little bit shameful because you know if you're a penniless, that must be because you've done something wrong deep in your heart of hearts. And this expression, it occurs from around 1560, but the last uses seem to be around 1900, so the end of the Victorian period. And then after that, it just isn't really used. We don't need it anymore. There's other ways of saying, oh, yeah. actually, I can't think of another way of idiomatically expressing that somebody is going begging, but I'm sure there are some. We've also got the expression a penny father, meaning a miser. And again, that is from the 16th century and survives up until the early Victorian period. And it still shows up. There are people who have this as a surname. But we basically don't use it. So some of these expressions die off on their own, regardless of the health of the penny. I also have here a couple of visual representations of things we do with pennies, customary behavior. We use them to decorate penny loafers. <coughs> Okay, so how many of you can remember wearing penny loafers with pennies? Just tell me a little bit about this. Was it a shiny penny better or an old penny better? Shiny, shiny, new. shiny new. When you got to shoot. Heads up, tails up. Doesn't matter. Which one? Heads up. So there's this specific aesthetic behavior, not just pennies, but the way you use pennies. And you've got to have a nice, shiny penny to show that you've got shiny new shoes. Fast forward to other shoes that are being decorated, Crocs, for instance. I'm not aware of people decorating their Crocs with coins. I try not to look at them anyway. Uh, so we have coins as decoration. But we also have rather more abstract behavior, such as this is a person about to toss their penny into a fountain. And this is something that actually not only is it difficult to motivate based on pure 100% cold 
rational logic. I am going to toss my valuables into water in the hopes that something good will happen. But it actually causes serious problems. This behavior is so deeply, deeply, deeply ingrained. Some of you may remember a couple of years ago at the Vancouver Aquarium, we lost one of our belugas. I say our belugas, our Vancouverites belugas. I don't actually own the belugas. Uh, we lost them because somebody had tossed a penny into the enclosure and it got stuck in the little whale's blowhole somehow, or inside, or it ate it. I can't remember what happened. But anyway, the penny caused the animal to die. And this is something you see at zoos and aquariums all around, at least North America in my experience, where there will be signs, do not throw money into the water with the animals, you idiots. They try not to express that last thing. But people can't help it. They see a body of water, and they want to toss coins in. And it's actually a problem if there's live animals in there. Um, but we still do it. Why do we do it? Well, as with so many things, we don't know, but we have been doing it for thousands of years. Um, as I've been mentioning my qualifications in studying this as a folklorist, which is what my PhD is in, folklore and mythology. But within that, I have a specialty in Celtic studies. And one of the things we know about ancient Celtic material culture is that they had a great fondness for tossing valuable objects into water, particularly wells and springs. So if you, for instance, ever go to Bath in England, which I seriously recommend, it's, it's one of my favorite places to go, they've dug up tons and tons of coins from this medicinal spring there that that's, people would go and take the waters at Bath and Romans, they dropped lots of things in there. They dropped cursed tablets, de ficciones, into the water. So if, for instance, somebody annoyed you or stole from you, you'd write on a little lead tablet, please, O oh, goddess Sulis Minerva, please do what is appropriate for this person. You know, kill them or take out their insides or let them die of the bloody flux or whatever. They'd roll up the little lead tablet and they'd toss that into the water. Or they would toss money into the water. And so this seems to be a hint at what's happening is it was felt that the other world, the sort of supernatural realm, was accessible via water. Uh, and we know this again from later medieval Celtic literature at least, where the other world is conceived of as being either underneath the water or across water. And so essentially when you toss something valuable into the water, you are giving it to the other world, you're offering payment and basically saying, here, here's a penny. Could you now do this for me? So again, if you think of it at a time when a coin was a much larger piece of value, this is actually a little investment in some supernatural action. Over time, that seems to degrade to luck. We no longer have a terribly specific belief, but even in comparatively recent times, we do find plenty of valuable objects left at springs for the saints, for instance, who are named supernatural entities that can actually help you with what you need, cure your aches and pains. If you could find the right saint, harm your enemies. But that this behavior really does seem to be linked to our beliefs in the supernatural and to be quite old. The problem with a lot of this stuff is that we've got some ancient material culture evidence and then fast forward 1,500 years, we've got some verbal evidence. People explain what they're doing and why they think they're doing it. And we've got a really large 1,500-year gap in the middle where we see fits and starts, but we don't have a lot of evidence. So we end up with a lot of speculation here. Well, this is the most likely explanation. People have been doing this because they feel it's right to do it. It's a lot easier to change people's rationalization for a behavior than it is to get them to change the behavior. So <clears throat> you can tell them, stop sacrificing to the pagan gods that we're no longer having you believe in, but it's easier to tell them to change gods than it is to get them to stop tossing stuff into water. And again, think of our modern experience with the poor belugas at the aquarium. It's, you know, people know better, but they just can't help it. They think, oh, one won't hurt for luck, or it's so much fun for the kids to toss valuables into water. And again, I don't toss pennies into inappropriate water, but I, I am guilty of, you know, maybe into the bay or you know, someplace where it's not going to do any harm. In any case, 
Uh, now, I've given this talk once before, and I had a question last time which I was not able to answer. Somebody said, what about pennies on the eyes of the dead? And I thought, oh, that's a really good question. I'd better look that up in case somebody asks on the 1st of March. So <clears throat> this is our corpse. This is actually a more complicated question than I thought it was, because it doesn't seem as if people basically ever did put pennies on the eyes of the dead. And we seem to have only thought that they did comparatively recently. But it does date back to the ancient world. So we'll start where we have early evidence from ancient Greece. And the ancient Greek custom is transferred to or shared with Rome. It's hard to tell. And the Romans brought it to Britain, from which it comes forward. So in ancient Greece, an obolos, which is a small silver coin. Again, remember that silver. Um, According to Wikipedia, I am not an expert in ancient Greek currency, this is worth about a day's wages in ancient Greece. So not the investment of a lifetime, but not chump change either. So this was buried in the hands of the dead, mostly, and sometimes, especially later, in the mouth of the dead. Nothing to do with the eyes, and not really a penny, except in the sense that it's an equivalent basic silver coin. And according to an article I was reading this morning, about 10% of the burials in a given excavated cemetery had this. So it wasn't necessarily mandatory. But the idea is that this coin would pay for passage, paying caro on the ferryman to get you across the river Styx and into the underworld, into the land of the dead, where you needed to go. Um, one wonders, if you perhaps don't want to go to the land of the dead, why you wouldn't just say, Sorry, can't do it, no money, I'll just have to not die. That doesn't seem to have been an option. Although there, there is a nice little workaround. Apparently, there was a, a town in, in Greece called uh, Hermione, like um, the one in Harry Potter, which uh, had a deep fissure in the earth. And it was felt by the locals that this was kind of a back way into Hades. So they didn't need to bury their dead with coins because they had kind of a back entrance that didn't go across the water, so they didn't need to pay the ferryman. Very nice. In any case, so we have this, and this custom of burying coins with the dead seems to have spread in the ancient Greek world, so that the Jews in the first century were also burying some coins with their dead, despite the fact that there's no particular reason for them to do so other than contact with Greek culture. So then we fast forward to the modern day. Uh, one of the early prominent folklorist was a guy called James Fraser, who was a classicist, and he wrote The Golden Bough, which is a huge compendium of customary behavior and traditions from all over the world. It's a great resource kind of gathering together all this weird behavior of humanity. But then, of course, it's also overlaid with Fraser's crackpot theories. And the trouble is, Fraser, he... You know, in, in many ways, he was a genius. So every now and then, he comes up with this brilliant observation that stood the test of time. So his theories of how magic works with sympathetic magic, that is absolutely the core foundation of magical studies. And then a lot of the other stuff he says is just errant, absolute nonsense. So in lots of places that he collected data from, uh, when we have our, our more modern corpse, Note the cell phone. <laughs> Instead of an obolos in the hand, people would put silver coins on the eyes. Um, I tried to make them eye-sized, but then you couldn't really see them. So uh, this is a half crown, which uh, is attested from Devon in the early 20th century as something they remember their grandparents doing. So we don't know if they remembered correctly or if they got it wrong. We don't have an actual corpse with half crowns on the eyes, but at least somebody said they did. And so Fraser's theory about this was that the coins were put on the eyes because we wanted to symbolically blind the dead so that they wouldn't find their way back to get us. I don't know about that one. I No, I don't think so. Because all over the world, one of the things we do with dead bodies, is we close the eyes. And we make them look like they're asleep, in part because death is seen metaphorically as a long sleep from which, ideally, 
somehow you will wake up. So the coins can kind of practically speaking keep the eyes closed as well as be a little bit more visible if you've laid out the dead. If you stick a coin in their pocket, you know, who's going to know? But this is nice and visible when you've laid out the corpse in an old-fashioned wake. You can see what's going on, as well as perhaps being a continuation of this custom. Again, this is one of the things we see the behavior. We dig up bodies from the ancient world all over Mediterranean Europe, Britain, France, and we find these coins in hand or mouth. Not so much in eyes, although it's sometimes difficult to tell because, obviously, when there's no more flesh left, what happens is the coin falls into the skull. You're like, well, it was on top of one of the holes. Uh, but some of the ways they can tell are that the jaws are sometimes uh, tarnished a little bit from being in contact with the metal. So it's a creepy archaeology thing. Anyway, so we've, we've got this. It doesn't seem to be pennies at all, just coins in general, especially perhaps silver coins like the obolos or the half crown, although again I did find references to people who didn't have coins to spare, putting little cardboard circles on as kind of symbolic coins. And uh, also in the, in the ancient world, using really, really old coins that nobody would take anymore because, you know, Charon the ferryman is kind of timeless, so good use for them, he, he won't know. All right. There's also the modern lucky penny. Uh, I just, I thought this was very funny. So we have this belief that if you find a penny, it's lucky. And I'm absolutely fascinated by this because where does this luck come from? Why does this work? Why do so many people do it? Why do so many people not do it? So I'm interested in kind of, we all have the same basic belief if you find a penny, it's lucky. But nobody really tells you explicitly what the parameters are of this belief. So people change it. <clears throat> so the bare bones superstition, superstitions are often expressed with kind of this if-then formula. If you find a penny and you pick it up, just going, oh, look, there is a penny. That does nothing for you. Uh, then you will have good luck. So there is kind of an awareness and an action. There's also sometimes what we call a turn, the kind of unless portion, unless it is tails up or some other variation. So sometimes people who believe this will go, oh no, it's tails up, I, I can't have that, or it will bring me no luck, it does no good. So for myself personally, I think the first place I was really aware of this in writing was in uh, Louis Untermeyer's Golden Treasury of Poetry, where it says, see a pin and pick it up all the day, you'll have good luck. See a pen and let it lie, you'll be sorry by and by. In my own little, I don't know how old I was, head, somehow I managed to conflate this with the penny one, because it's pretty similar. And so, my little superstitious self, I was kind of afraid not to pick up pennies. And sometimes this you know, brings you into conflict, so if you're if you're in the 7-Eleven and someone's dropped it on the floor, it's like, okay, well, I, I must pick it up, but it's not mine, I can't keep it, so I'll just put it on the counter, maybe that will count. <clears throat> and then a few years later, uh, I was in junior high school, and then I first heard this tails up belief uh, from my friend James Zeef, actually. Heads up pennies are good luck, but tails up pennies are bad luck. Oh no, what do I do? Because <laughs> I have to pick it up. I can't pick it up. I must. I can't. <laughs> so eventually, my, my little pre-academically trained self kind of went, well, this is what I was aware of first, so that's the one that counts, and this one doesn't count, and there you go. But it brings up the question, when you've got conflicting belief systems, what do you do? And you know, this is where I confess freely and frankly that my superstition on this one is actually fairly strong. Um, rationally, I know better, but that's not going to stop me. So uh, after a while, when I was teaching anthropology uh, down in California, and I had a nice large data set, so a couple of classes roughly this size, I handed out questionnaires. And one of the questions I asked was, do you know any rhymes about a lucky penny? Write it down here. And some people didn't know it. But a lot of people did, and so I collected all the different versions. 
So the first line was, if you find a lucky penny, if you see a penny, find a lucky penny, if you, well, I think I've gone through all the variations, there's only a few. But anyway, the little blank line is if they omitted that part. So this is everything that was collected. And the earliest printed version I can find of this rhyme is from only 1883 from England. And that is, again, with the pin. I think this is where Louis Untermeyer got it from a, a Charlotte Sophia Burns collection of Shropshire folklore. See a pin and pick it up. All the day you'll have good luck. If you'll notice this uh, Northridge, California, in just a few years ago, maybe five years ago now, the entirety of this 1883 rhyme is preserved somewhere within the existing tradition. See a penny, except for pin, and pick it up all the day you'll have good luck. That's all still there, somewhere within the variation that is oral tradition. However, if you change it up and do the most common variance, which is in red there, and this is a little messy, let me tidy it up, and put that together, then you get find a penny, pick it up, all day long you'll have good luck. So even though everything is still there, it's changed. However, it's still poetry, and it's really interesting poetry as well. These days, if you open the pages of New Yorker, you never find rhyming verse or verse with meter. And this is one of these things. I, just, I think it's really important to be able to scan poetry metrically. I am alone in this, but I totally do. So <clears throat> find a penny, pick it up. All day long, you'll have good luck. So what you find is a rhyming folk couplet in iambic tetrameter, and the rhyme is a short uh, syllable plus a voiceless stop, so this short uh, vowel sound, up and uck. Not a perfect rhyme, but it'll do. But what I also found is that there's a lot of other rhymes about pennies that aren't related to this that come up in folk tradition, or that they're distantly related. Penny facing up, good luck. Penny facing down, leave it on the ground. This is clearly circulates among a community that does not understand scansion because it's terrible rhythm. But you've got heads up, pick it up, or heads up, good luck, little rhyming mnemonic devices. And there's a few other more different ones. Give a penny to a friend, then your luck will never end. So, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Depends on the friend, I suppose. <clears throat> so this is here. And again, I wonder, is this going to survive the penny? I've been paying attention. I still find the odd penny on the ground, but not nearly as much as I used to. What I'm finding now are dimes. Not many nickels, but the smallest physical coin, that's the one people tend to go, eh, whatever, and leave it there for me to find. And of course, one of my key questions is, well, if a penny is lucky, is a dime lucky? And I thought that was a no-brainer. You know, if a penny is lucky, then a dime, being worth 10 pennies, is worth 10 lux. So clearly, it's 10 times as lucky. But when I started actually asking people the question, I found that while I was not alone in that view, I almost was. So most people went, no, it's just a dime. I mean, you have a dime, but there's no luck. Oh, it was all right. So I started asking about this. But before we even get to that, I want to know, so is it a pin or is it a penny? Which one is, is the real thing, is the heart of the rhyme? So here's some data points. 1935, Detroit, a couple of pieces of folklore collected. If you find a penny, you should keep it. There's no rhyme. There's no attempt at a rhyme. It's just like, oh, find it, keep it. Don't be an idiot. It's money. And then carry a gift penny for luck. So a gift penny uh, is if you give somebody clothing or a wallet, it's considered bad luck to give it with empty pockets or, or the empty wallet because symbolically, that is giving them something with empty pockets or giving them an empty wallet. So if you put even a little bit of money in there, then that symbolically means you won't have empty pockets or empty wallet. Um, oddly, it doesn't mean you'll only just have a penny in your wallet, but a penny kind of stands for money as a whole. And so this is a tradition, and sometimes people will tuck a little bit more in, but generally a penny. So that seems to be what it's referring to here, is not a found penny, but a given penny. Data points further. From Illinois in the 50, find a penny, have good luck. There it is again. 
56. Find a penny. It's good luck if you put it in your shoe. Okay, so you have to do a little further with it. And then in 1970s, then we see the penny associated with that rhyme. So probably it was around before that, but that's just the first time anyone bothered to write it down. But that's still quite late, considering it's written down about pins in the 1880s. So it takes 90 years for it to be transferred to pennies and make that into the written record. But as you can see from the blank space on the screen, we've got some more data points. 1909 and 11, finding money in general is good luck if you do something specific. Hide it, if it's heads up, if you spit on it. So the heads upness actually predates the lucky penny found thing. So as a child, I was actually wrong, whatever. It happens once, you know. Uh, finding money is good luck, but only if you give it away. And then if we look at some other data points, finding money is bad luck from 92, bad luck from 57, but uh oh, going earlier in time, bad luck from 1873, from the 17th century, from the 16th century. So rather more consistently, it seems like finding money in opposite land is bad luck. Hmm. And then a little bit further, finding a pin is good luck. And we've got that with the rhyme in Oregon as late as 1965. You've already seen 1883, because I only have so much room on the screen. Uh, finding a pin is good luck, 85 again, 88 in Philadelphia, so England and Philadelphia both. So it does seem that the finding the pin being good luck came first, and then got transferred to the penny gradually and the reason the dime might not be good luck is because the penny was the exception. Finding money was bad luck, and we made an exception for the penny because it's so close in sound to pin and, especially when you say it fast. And then just a couple other data points. The German Glückspenny is mentioned in 1669 as being pagan in origin, but that's that, literally, it's the luck penny in German, but it's that same idea of a penny you give to someone with new clothing or something as a gift. And in 1778, the firm term luck penny is first used in English, again, to refer to that penny as part of a gift. So in other words, found money was bad, but a lucky penny could be had as a gift, and finding a pin is good. And those two things seem to merge sometime in the early 20th century. And then finally, earliest of all, we have the goddess penny, a small sum paid as earnest money on striking a bargain, especially on concluding a purchase or the hiring of a servant. And what this is, I had to watch a lot of episodes of Judge Judy before I could understand what this meant. Basically, when you agree to buy something in the medieval world, pre-written contracts, if you say, oh yeah, I'm going to totally buy your horse, it's an awesome horse, if I later come back and say, well, I never said that, I don't want it, but I could have sold it to that other guy, no, no, no. So what you do is you say, I'm going to buy your horse, can't buy it right now, but I will, here's a penny for you, and if you've accepted this penny from me, now we've got a contract. Now the two of us have made an agreement, an offer has been made and accepted, as symbolized by this transfer of money to seal the deal. And that's the same thing with the luck penny in terms of giving a gift of clothing. That giving of a gift is establishing a relationship which metaphorically you want to continue. So for the same reason, sometimes if you give someone a knife, as a gift, you know, a nice Swiss Army knife, I will also give you a penny with it, because if I don't, that knife will cut the friendship and we'll no longer be friends. So I've got to give some money along with it so that it's not really a gift, it's a transaction. So pennies get this nice symbolic use just to kind of move things out of this slightly dangerous and slightly fraught realm. Uh, and that is a picture of fibulae for no particular reason. It's just there. Uh, yes? I never had this dilemma about it being lucky because I grew up being more immigrant, being more familiar with the pen. Mm -hmm. When I saw penny on the ground, it was always my grandmother's indoctrination. Take care of the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. And I religiously kept every penny and put it into a shilling and then I went and bought you know, tons of candy. So it was never quite the same dilemma because I was going with this other saying which was so important in our family. Right, so penny is thrift. Absolutely, in good sense. And yes. It would eventually give you riches. I'm still waiting, but you know, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look after the pennies and the pounds will take care of themselves. That's the same as penny wise and pound foolish. It's communicating the same information. And as you said, that's the dominant strain in England. It's only in America, North America, where you get this lucky penny thing strongly. And then later on, it bleeds over into Britain, but it's still not common. It's like American Halloween. And American Halloween comes from this preponderance of Irish immigrants who brought that cultural thing over. And I suspect very strongly that it's the German immigrants that were so important in the early history of Pennsylvania and some of the Midwest that brought this Glücksfending tradition in. And that's when it merges with the pin, is, is this combination of this substrate of German culture underlying the otherwise fairly Anglophone culture of British so Anglophone, I should say, North America. So that's, that's my suspicion. I also use that explanation for why Americans are obsessed with cinnamon. But. So anyway, what I did when I had my, my large chunk of folklore students was I, I gave them a little survey and I said, when do you pick up pennies? You know, you know, always, sometimes, or never, basically. And again, a small portion said always, and an even smaller portion said never. A lot of them said, well, it's more of a childhood thing. I used to, but now I don't. And uh, <clears throat> sort of larger chunks for eh, sometimes, maybe. So, OK, that's interesting. And then I asked them, well, OK, if there's a only sometimes, why? And some of them said, oh, well, the heads up thing, for sure. Or eh, no reason, just what I feel. And then some of them, you know, if it's in traffic, I'm not going to cross the highway to get a penny. Um, <clears throat> or I've been unlucky recently. I was just kind of throwing out these options here. But basically what we come up with is people didn't seem to know mostly. Some of them like the shiny ones, some of them like the heads up ones, but a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know, I just I do or I don't. So okay, people don't examine their lives. Um, <clears throat> I also was asking them, if you could change the luck, if a penny was bad luck because it was tails up, was there anything you could do? And most people, about three quarters of them, said no. But there's also a lot of ways to cheat. So you can change the luck if you turn it over, but you can't profit by it. So if I see a tails up penny, I can go flip it, leave it, and now it's lucky. I've made it lucky, but I can't profit by it. And then I allowed people kind of a write-in option, and they came up with these great things. I can turn it over with my shoe, and then I can pick it up. <laughs> I haven't touched it, but now it's lucky. Or I can kick it to turn it, or you know, like I can just turn it over and then pick it up, but you still have to do it. Or uh, <clears throat> I can just risk it. Might be bad luck, might not. You know, place it on a train track to be run over. I'm not sure how that helps, but OK. Or picking up left-handed, I like that one. <laughs> and then I said, well, why, if you do pick up pennies, why do you do it? And <clears throat> general luck, good luck, those were the dominant ones. Uh, but then some people, it's just like, well, to acquire money. It's not about the luck. It's about it being a penny. Is it what you were saying a minute ago? <laughs> and then I asked, if you don't pick up pennies, why not? And this was fascinating to me. So <clears throat> about a quarter of the people said, well, it's not worth it for just a penny. But almost half said, if someone sees me, then they might think I need a penny. And I think, oh, come on. It's the 21st century. Do you really think someone's going to go, oh, you're picking up a penny? You must be the sort of person for whom that represents a real difference in your financial well-being at the end of the day. <laughs> so again, it's still about the symbolic value and not the actual value. And then some other people are like, well, I don't believe in luck. I don't care. <laughs> I'm lazy. <laughs> and a couple of people said it, it's too dirty. It's like, a dog might have peed on it. Well, that's a risk I'm willing to take. So at the end of the day, I asked them to rank their belief on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being this is totally true, and if you tell me otherwise, I will punch you in the nose, and 1 being this is totally false, and anyone who believes it is an idiot. And I had answers, because I had a fairly large sample size, on a scale, everyone had chosen it one, two, three. You know, somebody picked all 10 numbers, but the average came out to 3.4.
So I can say that belief in lucky pennies is three and a half out of 10, at least for a few years ago in California, which is interesting to me because as far as I know, no one's ever tried to measure belief. We always think of it as binary. You either believe or you don't believe. But I think here it's like we, we are halfway to half believing or a third of the way to believing in lucky pennies. So <clears throat> having looked at all this stuff, what comes next? <clears throat> we could just replace our idioms. Turn an honest penny, note the typo, uh, to earn an honest dollar, or we could repurpose them. So people are doing interesting things with pennies. It's now cheaper to use pennies as flooring than it is to use, for instance, hardwood, which is sort of depressing, but there you go. And look, it's pretty. <clears throat> and then we've got some other examples. A dollar for your thoughts. I actually found that from 1897 in the novel Like a Gallant Lady, which I did not read. I just looked it up on Google Books. Um, and also a pound from your thoughts from another sort of fictional work around the same time. So people are already playing with the notion of substituting something else for the penny. And I thought I had come up with a loony for your thoughts, but alas, I did not. Already somebody talking about loons used it in 2004. So the loony now is actually worth what a penny was worth sometime in the Middle Ages, roughly. It's, the further back you go in time, the harder it is to measure exactly. So for 1913, we've got lots of good uh, consumer price index data. But going back, you're going to have to do a lot more guesswork. But right now, we're in the unique position of having our largest currency being what these smaller currencies used to be worth. And we don't have anything bigger. There's lots of folk names running around for a 20, or in the US, they'll talk about the Benjamins, the hundreds. But by and large, the, the dollar, our unit of currency, is, is what we have. And that's getting weaker and weaker with time and inflation. So we'll see what happens. And I thought I would just turn it over for you and, and ask I, a metaphorical loony for your thoughts. What do you think about all this? So thank you.